Okay, today we're going to start talking about uh, human lifespan development. And when we're talking today, basically what we want to go over is the differences from everything from infants to the geriatric population, which there's a lot of changes, and our biggest changes we're going to see um, is actually going to be in our pediatric population. Those are going to be the big aspects and a lot of different changes, so we'll spend a lot of time on that today. And here's kind of the different ranges we're looking at. So infancy to birth um, to 12 months, toddlers are the 12 to 36 months. You can see kind of the ages in here. And as we change into each of these ranges, pretty much all the way up to adolescence, there's significant changes in respiratory rate, vital signs, um, growth and development, anatomy uh, on them. And so those are going to be important factors for you guys to know. And obviously just here taking a look of the different stages potentially of patients that we're going to see. So um, again, pediatric population is going to be our greatest change, um, especially in our vital signs. So these are going to be all things that we're going to expect you guys to know. It takes a while. Hopefully a lot of you know this already. If not, this is going to be something that will be very important to know what normal is. You're going to hear me say this a lot in classes and lectures and in, in labs is it's more important to know what normal is than to know what abnormal is. If you know what normal is, then you're going to really know, hey, wait a minute, this is outside the range. This is not normally what I expect. So here's just a, this page, and then the next slide is going to be a table that I think you guys really need to know, especially as when we're uh, referring to vitals and what to be expecting um, from each of those. And then you can see, obviously, as we get into the adolescence to adulthood to geriatric, there's not going to be a lot of changes and that's going to be the easiest as pop population is what we expect. But again, the pediatric is where we're going to spend a lot of, bit, a lot of time um, with this. And so again, right in here is looking at what heart rates are. So obviously when we're dealing with a uh, infant, newborn, neonate, however you want to classify that, um, having heart rates up to 180 beats is within the normal range, especially for um, an infant just born. Um, as opposed to an adult, obviously, we're going to be looking more into the SBT um, possibility of ranges that we're at. Even sitting at about 120 beats, we're talking sinus tack for the adults, where that's going to be normal for some um, infants and neonates. So knowing what those are. Respiratory rates, again, um, our big one is knowing when do we need to bag that patient what is within normal, what is acceptable. All these things are very important to know uh, and going to expect that you guys do know these, especially in the scenarios that we're going to be given to you. And then knowing what the normal uh, blood pressure is related to there. So I'm going to give you guys a couple of different things um, as far as figuring out blood pressures, especially for young kids. And realistically, where we go is you can use either 70 or 72 have been pretty much the two numbers that I've seen in different texts and, and uh, articles, uh, plus the patient's age. That would give you um, a systolic blood pressure area, a low range of systolic blood pressure that would be equivalent or acceptable. So you get a two-year-old, a systolic blood pressure of 72 to 74 is acceptable. Now granted we're hoping they're closer to you know 90, things like that, but that it's basically their age plus 70 or 72 gives you at least a normal with systolic. Below that is going to be an abnormal reading. That's kind of the lowest acceptable systolic readings. So um, other aspects we're going to be talking about is what their weight is, how much the child is expected to grow um, from birth once they go home in the first month, in the first three months in the first year, um, and kind of knowing what those weights should be. And granted, there's going to be some big changes between kids, but normally one of the things we'll see is after birth, the child usually drops weight um, in the first week going home, and then we'll start to double and, and go from there as we get into later months. So those are all important aspects to kind of get just a general, general idea as if we're having a patient who's having a problem failure to thrive, or we've got some which, which is in the normal range of what to expect. So um, that's kind of what we're going to be looking for. And again, knowing more what normal is, then you're going to know what abnormal is. That's an easy way to start. Obviously, we want you to know all everything, but at first, know your normals. Know everything from there, and then you're going to know when something is abnormal and be able to figure out what it is from there. Um, in development, and you're going to get this in uh, Dr. Edminster's lecture as well, talking about the ductus venosus, 
um, the foraminal valley and the heart and basically how those things are going to change from how blood flow is coming into the child um, in uterine versus once they've been born, um, those changes that we're going to see of closing everything off and starting to actually use the lungs and, and the respiratory tract instead of bypassing that. Um, and then blood flow going from just arteries equally and down to the valves now to be closing off um, that break between the right and the left uh, atrium. So all different things that we're going to be able to see and how that goes. Um, once we get that area where the baby takes its first breath um, and starts bring, breathing oxygen into there, it's going to close off those areas. Um, and we'll also talk about later when we get into more cardiology, some of those abnormalities that can still happen when something doesn't quite close off or something doesn't quite um, work the way we're expecting. Again, you know what normal is, you're going to figure out what abnormal is. So, as you can see, basically this is the aspect of where the baby's been not breathing and getting total oxygen exchange has been pretty much coming um, from the umbilical cord. Now once we get that birth and we get that area, the baby takes the first breath, that's going to blow up the lungs, fill that up. And once that does, then that's going to be the cue for the lungs to um, secrete surfactant. Surfactant is going to be that um, chemical almost basically that's going to fill up each of the alveoli and help maintain those positions and help it maintain opening. Um, imagine blowing a balloon up where that first forceful area could get that past where the balloon starts to open up and surfactant is what's going to keep it open as opposed to collapsing on itself. Um, and it's going to reduce that uh, the ability of the lungs to collapse and we'll talk about atelectasis later on which is a collapsing of those lungs um, and what removes the surfactant, but that's really the process that's going to be happening. Some of the differences that you're going to see immediately is the airway. Um, airway in a child, a couple of different things we're going to be looking at. Well, one, the head's going to be bigger, so positionally when they're laying supine is going to uh, potentially obstruct that airway. The airway is shorter, it's narrower uh, because of their size, it's less stable because it doesn't have cartilaginous rings around it supporting there, so it's easily able to compress, um, become obstructed. Um, most of the time, they're not uh, going to be breathing through the mouth. They're going to be really nose breathers, and because of um, how their body is not developed yet, they're going to be belly breathers. They're going to be using accessory muscles. They're going to be using grunting to get air. There's a lot of different things that they have to do, especially as infants. Um, we're going to see their chest wall is less rigid. Obviously, there again, they're going to be more cartilaginous and not fully um, had the osteocytes and osteoblasts fill and and uh, foreign bony. They're going to be very cartilaginous. Um, how the ribs are positioned, um, kidneys are going to be just starting to work and they're not going to really able to be in full function yet as it's growing. And then they become kids and geriatric population. You're going to see are very close to what happens there, and they're both areas that can come very, excuse me, both populations that can come um, very easily dehydrated. Um, so we've got to be watching out for that as well. Most of their immunities that they're going to be doing are acquired initially through um, the umbilical cord. Uh, we're going to talk about breastfed babies versus those on formula, um, and they say you're passing a lot more immunities that way. Um, so these are going to be just some other aspects in here towards that development of the infant into growing as in, into a child. Um, the other thing that we're going to see is the moral reflex or the startle reflex. Um, and you maybe have seen this if you have kids um, or have nephews, nieces, anyone you've been around, you'll see that area where <clears throat> they will startle easier, the arms will go wide, the fingers will spread, and then they'll grab. If you put your finger into um, the palm of a, a baby, the instinct is going to be to grab it, squeeze very tight, and then you'll see that will kind of let go from there. But you're going to see that quick reaction. Um, that's what the palmer grasp is that I was just talking about. Um, and then it kind of weakens about over time, but that's going to be kind of one of those instincts you're going to be able to see of how responsive that patient is by putting a finger in into their palm, and if it grabs quickly, that's going to be a normal response. If they don't, and they're more, um, not no response to it at all, um, you're going to know that's not a normal response and be looking for other things. Again, going back to my statement previously of looking for what is normal. 
other development areas you're going to be seeing um, here, again, the, the rooting reflex and the sucking reflex, as you can kind of see. And this is going to be the instinct for the baby to start feeding. Uh, the fontanelles um, on the head, this is going to be able to tell us a lot um, when we're really looking for a dehydrated baby or if we're looking for intracranial pressure, encephalitis, other different things out there, we're going to be looking around those fontanelles uh, because that's where um, a lot of fluid can go because that they the fontanelles have not fused yet to form the full skull and cranium. So you're going to see that little hole in the top of the head and when they're dehydrated, you're going to be able to see it drop down when they have encephalopathy, um, increased intracranial pressure, you're going to see that area bulging on there. And that's going to be another indicating factor when they're young of whether we're dealing with um, intracranial pressure or we're dealing with dehydration. Their normal sleep developments, and again, this, I have to take this with a grain of salt because I've had two kids and they were completely different on their sleep cycles of where they are. And those of you who have had kids may have had this where some have been sleeping through the night and some only sleep in two hour periods. So it just really depends and so there's no hard or set fast rule um, with sleep patterns on these. They are going to be different. And then how they grow and factors in development um, they talk about here. Um, so. I'm not going to get too much into this portion right now. There are going to be rapid changes, you know, in those first two months where they start tracking objects, they start um, recognizing people, how they respond. The big thing is, is when we're getting to a little bit older ages, is what are the normal type of responses when they're around people? What are the normal actions? And, and we'll get into that as we get up. Still talking about the infancy though, um, again, this can vary so much in here. Um, so just kind of take this with a grain of salt of what you, what you expect, take it from your experiences here. Um, but again, at five months, sleep through the night without waking or feeding. Well, I had my first who did that at three months and I had my second child who didn't do that until like nine months. So again, take everything with a grain of salt of what you're doing here. So I'm not going to go too much over these areas here too. And at seven months of age, I, my kids were not fear of strangers at all. Um, so hard to say. Again, reactions. So take all these with a grain of salt. When they speak, um, when they walk, all those different things are going to take different times, and different kids are going to advance at, at different moments, it's moments in time. These are just generalities on here, and going all the way up from 11 months to 12 months. So um, again, everything's going to be a generality of how their development is what they're exposed to, a lot of differences in here. So again, take these with a grain of salt. Now the psychosocial development, basically this develops as to the reactions, the environments, um, the socia socialization, I uh, can't speak today, sorry, um, of what the child is exposed to. And so this is going to vary from uh, infant to infant. Um, how the baby comes in crying, obviously, is their only way, usually, of communicating um, when there's something wrong. Uh, that's usually there, and that's the hardest part of trying to diagnose a lot of these things when they can't talk to you and tell you exactly what's wrong and, and a very difficult part of, of pediatrics um, and how they respond there. So here's basically, again, Take a look at this. Um, read everything with a, a grain of salt. I'm not going to get too much into into this aspect. It's uh, it does vary a lot from family to family and from child to child from there. So I'm going to kind of just skip off of some of those areas. Um, these are just other development. I hate getting into the psychosocial. It's not my area of expertise, um, but this is just kind of talking about some aspects of how the children grow, what they they develop on and how they develop their uh, um, perception. Scaffolding, building on what they know, again this is probably something we're not going to be testing you on or anything like that, but just being aware of how there's differences in society between how children's come. Um, and again in between the family and that of how the children warms up, how the how they are as far as parenting, what their environment is, um, and and how they're treated raised up. So it is going to be very good. What I want to get into more is this stuff, into the vitals. That's the more important aspect that we'll be dealing with. 
And what I want you to know is, again, this is the array for toddlers, the vital signs, what to expect on them. So what type of vital signs do you expect? And what is the interactions you expect to have with each of those? So obviously dealing with toddlers, this is about the, the type age. Um, and a parent's on here that we're looking. They're able to stand, they're able to move, they're crawling. Um, Preschoolers is more to three to five. You can see their heart rates, 7110. We're starting to get more to what a normal adult is. So we really start with those high heart rates, high respiratory rates, low blood pressures, and then we're slowly kind of building up. The heart rate goes down, the blood pressure goes up, and the respiratory rate is going down. So those are kind of um, some areas, and then getting us some idea of what their weights are. Um, those are going to be a big thing of identifying how much a child weighs, how much an adult weighs, especially as we get into um, drug calculations and weight-based calculations. They're going to be um, developing more with their lungs, their muscles. Um, it's slowly developing up to those adult ages. They're still going to be tiring really quickly at those ages. Um, that toddler still would say talking naps because they're still going to be growing. Um, quite a bit and can can develop in height uh, and weight very quickly over over a short time frame. Um, now the kidneys becoming developed. Um, this is a time too when uh, the toddler and preschool age they're exposed to a lot of potential infections so we see these kids getting sick a lot um, and this is the time they're really getting those active immunities versus the passive immunities. Passive immunities coming from mom from either breastfeeding or from uh, the umbilical cord to now the active immunities where they're getting exposed to um, colds, infections, things like that. This is also the time we do most of our vaccinations as well uh, because during this period they can uh, actually build up immunities much stronger than later on in life. And then kind of some more development areas of where they are as far as language and that get very so much from kids to kids but these are pretty much the averages of what to expect. And you can see from here different aspects in the, based on their ages of, of where they're at. Um, playing simple games, following basic rules. Um, big thing to know on here is that's how to work with these kids, is playing games with them sometimes. And games may be as simple as this is the type of kids when you're trying to listen to lungs, you're trying to get blood pressures, that maybe you show them to do it on you. And this is kind of that back and forth type of thing of, of gaining their trust and allowing them to do it. Some kids will allow you to do blood pressures, listen to the lungs very easily. Some you got to work with a little bit and playing a little game with them of how you get to be able to get some of their vitals. Again, it's also based on you know how they're doing and presenting and, and what kind of situation it is. Um, Again, more as part into this psychosocial development, which we're not going to get into the testing aspect. Our concentration is going to be more on, on vital signs and interactions is going to be the big thing. That's going to be the important part to know. Um, and again, I'm going to just kind of skip over this area. You guys can read there. Um, not really getting into this. It's not a testing area, not anything like that that we're looking for. I'm more looking on what uh, the children... Um, are how they're going to react, what to expect. Again, what should normally you see when dealing with a, a toddler or preschool age? What should be our normal vital signs? Those are going to be the big things that we're looking to see um, and where they're at. So that's going to be where I'm going to focus, um, where I'm not focusing on this kind of stuff. So, um, and I not going to get into this as you can see here you can read across this I'm gonna leave that up there for you to read and say there but again I'm not going to get into that aspect that's not really my area of expertise this is the area of that again why I want to jump in now to again school age you can see the heart rate again slowing down respiratory rate slowing down blood pressure going up um, and about how much they're going um, in height and weight and what to expect in development um, this is the age two we start seeing especially the later toward the end becoming awkward and uh, growing into their bodies. This this, and, and the next stage you're going to see that. So you're going to see a lot more of traumatic injuries of just sometimes clumsiness and growing into their body, especially when they grow overnight a huge amount and then um, getting used to that. So um, where they are as again their confidence level, 
um, how their interaction should be with you, what to expect. Again, these are all different things here. Um, and again, I'm, the psychosocial portions, I'm, I'd like to take those, you know, and leave that to you as a grain of salt from there because I'm not really getting into that aspect. I know I keep saying that multiple times here. So this is kind of the uh, what we're looking at as far as the size of that age and and uh, becoming active. As we get into that adolescence, again, we're almost back to what we expect with the adult heart rate. We're getting close into their respiratory rate. We're pretty much right within normal there. Blood pressure range. We're right there in the normal there. Um, and how they act. Now the difference here, especially in the adolescence and, and sometimes in that preschool development age is those areas of um, respect towards the kids. They're going to be more conscious of their body and their development and um, so you got to be very careful with uh, your assessments especially on uh, young girls and, and that and what they're doing and what, uh, how you can approach them. This is also going to be um, the area where kids a lot of times to get questions out of them you may have to take them away from parents as opposed to the young kids you actually want to be in parents laps to get uh, the information out that you're looking for. So um, with a lot of changes again the big thing is pulling them aside sometimes or getting parents out of the room to ask them other questions so you can ask the child hey I'm just getting this out I'm trying to help you out what's going on so you can talk to them in private um, and you can find out a lot more information um, from them again looking out for their best interests and sometimes you need to do that to ask those questions. Um, and then like I said the body image is a concern on there so um, it's showing respect for them and, and uh, that aspect. Um, we're also getting into this, um, I haven't seen it as frequently in, in uh, males, more commonly in the females, but the eating disorders, um, but we see areas where depression and suicide is a huge area that we're always dealing with and we got to be cognizant about and that's where you got to spend the time of, of delving into this especially um, if someone has a potential or parents are calling for the potential of a suicide there so take these very seriously as with bullying that's been going on and other different things that we see unfortunately more frequently or at least more recognized out there than, than maybe years past of uh, really keeping an eye out that and looking out for those patients. As we get into early adulthood Again, these are the normal rates we're used to. Um, as far as we're looking at heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, you guys should be very familiar with these um, and know exactly what to expect. So in this area here, um, a lot of things that we'll get into is um, as we come up, this is going to be the highest uh, population here usually where we're going to see childbirth. Um, this is going to be a, a lot of stress related injuries, um, job related injuries, different things like that we're going to be looking at. As we get to the middle age adult again heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure are all going to be about the same. This is where we're going to start to see some some other changes. Um, we're seeing people generally staying healthier now in these ages whereas before we saw a lot of significant changes health wise um, years past. But this is where we're going to start to see cardiovascular instances, um, high blood pressure, a lot of different things coming into place that will uh, be effective liver disorders, kidney disorders, all these things since we start coming this age. Um, but we'll see people are becoming more active um, later in life than had been previously and people are staying healthier. Uh, we are unfortunately seeing higher cancer um, being diagnosed in this age. It's unfortunately across the board of all ages, but we're seeing it more in this age. Um, people again are becoming more conscious of physical activity um, and then weight control is going to be a thing we're seeing a lot more people focusing on now than maybe years past. Um, when we get into the older ages, again, late adulthood, here's where we're going to see some people stay very healthy into their 90s with no problems. A lot of people though we're going to be looking at multiple changes. Um, uh, polypharmacia, they're going to be on multiple different medications in those and so we're going to do a lot of different scenarios with a lot of different medications we're going to give you to get, kind of get used to that and what to expect. As we get in here though, um, in the adulthood it's the same as the geriatric. Um, here's where we're going to see a lot more problems trying to diagnose things. Um, we'll see a lot more neuropathies as they get older in age. So basically their inability to feel pain in certain areas and nerves kind of dying off. So 
um, a heart attack in a 40 year old may present as extreme pain substernal whereas late adulthood they may have these quote silent MIs where they're not even feeling pain um, so a lot of different things we're seeing the muscles have been um, usually sometimes cannot be as strong the valves start wearing out in theirs arteries can be blocked over periods of time um, volume decreases all sorts of things that can be happen and there was a huge population of smoking quite a while that is now getting to those older ages um, so we'd be looking for a lot of uh, COPD or emphysema a lot of different respiratory diseases as well with this um, other changes that we're seeing on here as you can see um, we'll get patients that have lost their teeth um, and so we're dealing with a lot of airway issues um, of how, what they're able to eat and we're going to look for uh, maintaining a uh, bag valve mask and we'll talk about that on someone who doesn't have dentures in place and, and did uh, that recently so um, taking a look at those um, we're not going to unfortunately play this video but we're going to do when we do a, a geriatrics class uh, more towards the fourth module we'll talk more about pharmacology and, and uh, what we're dealing with the adults. Other changes that we're going to see with them is their metabolic rate is going to decrease, um, their kidneys are going to be decreasing times, again generalities over there, not going to be everyone, um, and how they respond. So a lot of different changes as you can see as you get older in life. And we're going to be, um, for myself up at District 8, um, we see this a huge population because we have a, a great area of adult assisted living. This is going to be majority of the calls that I run on. We'll see what you guys do and based on your areas, but it's getting to be a, a bigger issue and as the baby boomers are becoming later in life, it's a huge population and that's where most of our calls are really going to be in this geriatric population. So we're going to spend a lot of time in, in this in classes and scenarios and, and going over what to expect. Um, and how to treat them from there because everything's going to be changing on them um, uh, we're going to get a lot more we've been dealing with a lot more dementia patients things like that so it's all about how you can react to them how to adjust and again finding out what normal is and what to expect um, as I said previously though we are getting people staying more active later into life than previously was done so we are finding um, hopefully people are living a little bit longer, they're taking care of themselves better and lasting. The other aspect we're seeing is um, home care services. I see this a ton in a lot of areas where uh, people are not necessarily going just to assisted living but they're small um, home care services where they're coming out and taking care of people in their own home able to live there as well as these small homes that are basically taking people in just like an assisted living area. So a lot of different areas that you can come in um, up in uh, Colbert area there's a ton of these homes that are in normal residences that you walk into and you'll find out there's probably about 10 patients staying there so knowing these areas um, you're gonna know your uh, for a lack of better term your frequent flyers in your areas that you work um, and where you're gonna be going um, and they're gonna see a lot of this these changes and again more people in assisted living as we go on um, and these baby boomers get in there Now this is another issue that we're seeing um, as we're getting those uh, patients who've retired. Unfortunately for those of you who have been out in the stores, you see the Walmart greeters that are 90 years old, it seems like 80 years old. People are having to work into their retirement because Social Security just isn't covering it. Um, I see a lot of people are put on medications and they're expensive and some people have chosen their medications over food or food over medications. Um, so there's a lot of this that we're seeing here and hopefully this is where we're able to involve the CARES team when we're going out to some of these homes and we see people who look like they need help um, because they're not being able to keep up on their their meds, their home living situation, um, a lot of different things and that's another part of our job is we got to be looking out for them uh, and seeing what we can do to help on the long term. Other aspect here, and unfortunately parents do this on, on a weekly basis almost it seems where it seems like they're going to a funeral for someone's friend. But this is going to be a huge aspect especially when um, you've had a uh, husband and wife, one of them dies, um, 
dealing with the grief and, and dealing with passing that on is going to be a huge aspect as you as a paramedic. We'll talk a lot more about death and dying and, and that approach, but it's usually it's the paramedic that after someone has died has got to go talk to the family. And maybe a lot of you have not done that yet. So that's another thing I want to, to push and focus on is um, throughout this next six months, um, I really want you, if you're on a call where someone has passed and you need, and the paramedic is going to talk to the families, maybe stepping in with them, listening to what they say, how they react. Um, obviously, the way I say it may not be the way you want to say it. The way your paramedic that you're working with now says it may not be the way you want to say it. Um, but listening to that and finding a comfortable way to put it in your own words because you'll find it's not an easy thing to do. There's never the right thing to say, but trying to find a process to, to talk about that, and we'll talk about more of that in class and other scenarios. So realistically, a summary on this area here, um, my big focus is knowing based on developmental age, where should this patient be as far as vitals, as far as interaction, um, as far as responsiveness, and what is the normal for that age and what to expect. Again, the more you're going to know normal, the more you'll know when something is abnormal. So those are kind of where, where I really want you to get out of this lecture and focus on that. And that's what we're going to do as we get into um, some more scenarios with this, is knowing what is the normal vital signs and the normal way that this age group should interact. Um, and that'll be the big focus. That's what we're going to test on and, and uh, hopefully prepare you for so when you're out there, um, two o'clock in the morning going on a three-year-old, you know exactly what to expect on that and what the normal should be, what their normal respiratory rate is, and, and is this patient breathing within the normal, heart rate within the normal, blood pressure within the normal, or is this going to be more of a of a issue that you're realizing that I got to develop, uh, investigate more and find out what's going on. All right. Thank you, guys.